often God or the sacred or religious life are seen as pious, orderly, quiet, calm, appropriate. There's a reason I avoid mentioning that I'm a minister in social gatherings when meeting new people. Because to most people, it suggests that I am all of those adjectives. <laughs> Worse, it suggests that I am only those adjectives. And let me tell you that pious, orderly, quiet, calm, appropriate is not the energy that I'm trying to bring to a party. <laughs> In just about every religious tradition, there is also an important role for celebration, creativity, humor, play, even chaos. That's what we're talking about today. Play on a bigger stage, an infinite scale. In most American Indian traditions, they embrace a mythical figure of a trickster. The trickster is often associated with coyotes, you may have heard that. In some cultures, it's also a rabbit or a raven. As you would probably guess, the trickster is a sort of clown figure, for lack of a better word, in our culture. He sometimes appears foolish or tricks others in ways that make them appear foolish, but always there's a lesson to be learned in breaking those rules. The trickster brings wisdom to those who are paying attention to his antics. On the other side of the globe, Hinduism in India has its own embrace of the sense of play. Krishna, one of the most popular and revered deities within Hinduism, maybe because he's a central figure in the most epic stories of the tradition, and these writings portray him not only as the universal supreme being, but also as the model lover, the divine hero, the godchild, and a prankster. These stories of his antics are typically called Krishna Leela or Krishna play. It's not only Krishna that brings playfulness to center stage. Religious scholar Alan Watts wrote, Hindus, when they speak of the creation of the universe, do not call it the work of God. They call it the play of God. The Vishnu Lila Lila, meaning play. And they look upon the whole manifestation of all the universe as play, as sport, as a kind of dance. All around the world is an inseparable part of the sacred is play. For some traditions, it's the very purpose of creation that we live and breathe and work and play in. It makes you wonder, how the heck did religion get so stodgy and serious sometimes? As I explored the importance of play this week, one of the most useful concepts that I saw pointed out was toward the infinite. In his book, Finite and Infinite Games, James Carse describes two very different types of play. We're familiar with finite games because there's a finite prize and limited resources. A sense of competition is baked into them. A sense of limitation also comes from a limited amount of time that players have to execute the game at hand. Probably most clearly, finite games have winners, and losers. As you probably guessed, infinite games are more collaborative. The purpose of the game, the sole purpose of the game is to have fun and keep playing. And to that end, the rules of the game evolve so that players are not excluded and the ending point can be pushed out further and further until everyone is satisfied with the playing. Sometimes I'm reminded of how different things were when I was a child back in my day. And yes, I know that sounds absurd to many of you. <laughs> but in my childhood, we had a stockpile of toy guns in my Unitarian Universalist home. 
when we ran around playing shoot 'em up or cops and robbers style game, and this was a very sort of boy centric household in Oklahoma. Even when we were playing in a pretty violent way, there was no sense of being eliminated from the game once you were shot. There was no winning or time limit or prize. We were just running around embodying chaos and it was wonderful. These days, most of the infinite game playing that I see occurs up at Camp de Beneville Pines. It's almost jarring from my everyday adult competitive world to see children just change the rules of board games as they play. <laughs> Camp is one of those few spaces where adults interact with children over all sorts of games and activities and we learn again the broader, dare I say, infinite opportunity to play. In his book, James Carse tells a story of Ron Jones, who was a high school basketball coach. As a newly appointed coach, Ron James was very excited for this opportunity to coach a high school team, and he was determined to have a winning season because he knew he had the talent and the knowledge to lead his team to victory. At the very first practice, only four students showed up. One was a wheelchair user. Eventually that day, a six foot tall girl arrived and decided to join the team. And now with five players, it was finally time to begin the practice. Only it took about 45 minutes to get them lined up at one side of the court in an orderly fashion. Clearly his plans for practice were not going to take shape. It was time to throw those out. They persisted together though. And slowly, as the coach threw out more and more of his plans, the team began to grow. According to the story, they had practices and cheerleaders and hot dogs, even if they might have seven or eight people playing at one time instead of five on the court. Sometimes he would stop a game right in the middle to play music and invite everyone in the stands to come down and dance. In the end, they became the only basketball team to win by a gazillion points. <laughs> well, not exactly a gazillion, but a whole bunch, because one of the team members working the scoreboard delighted in continually pushing the button for the scoreboard, regardless of who was winning. Some of you, and a big part of me, is thinking, what about the real game of basketball? What about the opportunity to learn skills and improve fitness and coordination? Competition isn't all bad. That's true. It's also true that there are plenty of teams and plenty of schools that offer structure in abundance. In fact, anywhere off of that basketball court, and for the rest of their lives, those players will be confronted with competition and limits. Life is replete with the finite kind of game. But for just a season or two, this coach offered a team of unruly basketball enthusiasts a chance to actually play at a game that was without limits, a game that had room for everyone, where everyone won, a gazillion points and infinite fun. Some of us stumble upon opportunities with great coaches or others that invite us to infinite play. But sometimes learning play is a struggle. All sorts of life transitions invite us to learn to play in new ways. I read this week, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, in a survey, asked people who were incarcerated or had been released for a while what they really needed. One of the things was learning to have fun in a safe and legal way. They needed to learn how to play in a way that was okay. Not just people released from prison, but people who are seeking a new life of sobriety. 
they too are confronted with the challenge of creating new social networks and opportunities to have fun. Perhaps more on target for our crowd, retirement and aging also invites an adjustment in finding opportunities to play in our lives. All of us need healthy go-tos in our times of boredom or our times of emotional stress. That's one of the magical things about faith community. We have the opportunity to play together sometimes. The Tapestry Explorers group here goes on all sorts of different adventures. I couldn't even name them because they're pretty off the wall. And I don't know of any other church community that provides, that is really dedicated to adventure and fun. And I love that idea. As much as anything, participating in this shared faith community can be and should be an opportunity to experiment with new ideas and new activities and new pieces of language. It's a spiritual home and hopefully a place to play too. I appreciate the way that infinite play seems to echo the sacred sorts of play of Hinduism and our own Judeo-Christian tradition. It's echoed most clearly in our being here today, on Sunday. Our carving out of one day of the week to invest in relaxing into the goodness of creation and honoring the wholeness of ourselves, traditionally called a Sabbath. Some say it this way, we are human beings, not human doings. Our highest purpose is not to work or to produce. Our highest purpose is to be. To be together in community, in connection with the sacred. To be in solitude, perhaps, cultivating inner wisdom. We're human beings, not human doings. And a person's worth does not depend on their ability to produce. In our culture, that is blasphemous. A person's worth is inherent. It's not something that we earn through doing enough or saying enough or knowing enough or creating enough. It's just there. Sabbath is an embodiment of our first principle. It's remembering that it doesn't matter how much we've achieved this week. It doesn't matter how if we accomplished running a marathon or restructured an entire team at work or if we got the kids bathed and fed yesterday. It doesn't matter if we retired five years ago or even if we messed up really bad and got fired because our worth and dignity are inherent. Abraham Joshua Heschel, probably the leading scholar on Sabbath, says that the Sabbath as a day of rest, as a day of abstaining from work, is not the purpose of recovering one's lost strength and becoming fit for the forthcoming week of labor. The Sabbath is a day for the sake of life. The Sabbath is not for the sake of the weekends or the weekdays, the weekdays are for the sake of the Sabbath. It's not an interlude, but a climax of our living. It takes some practice to pause and appreciate that we are enough. The Jewish creation myth of Genesis, the story that the Sabbath is based on, said that once God had created the world, including humans, God saw that it was good. And so there was a seventh day of rest and joy. Now, you don't have to believe in God. You certainly don't have to believe in that creation myth told in Genesis. But I urge you to find in your mind and heart enough space to appreciate <coughs> that creation is good. You and your life included. It's not because you earned it this week. It's simply good. 
I believe that one of the ways we change the world is by building community. It gives us the opportunity to practice building more just and loving relationships. We get to offer help from our abundance and receive help to get through our challenges. We get to sit with people whose stories are maybe different from our own and sing together. We get to engage and struggle for justice together. Perhaps most of all, we get to bump up against each other, figuratively and literally, to practice patience and forgiveness. It's a pretty amazing opportunity to play here. This week, as we talk about the deeper meanings of play, I'm reminded that our Sabbath, our time in religious community, is a time to see the world through a different lens. For a moment, we're invited to let go of the finite competition and embrace the possibility of the infinite. It's a time to recognize and value the inherent worth and dignity of our neighbors and ourselves, regardless of what we do, create, make, or achieve. It's good to play together. Amen.